Hello everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you for the uh, Quaker Business Conference. Uh, I'm, my name is Professor Rory Ridley Duff and I'm going to speak to you about six forms of wealth. Um, and I think this is a useful framework for thinking about the post-Covid context. I've got a couple of slides about myself um, and then I will get into the meat of the presentation. So just to kick us off, the work that we're doing on Sixth Forms of Wealth is by members of the Fair Shares Institute at Sheffield Business School. Uh, and what we mean by Sixth Forms of Wealth is thinking about not just financial capital, but also natural, human, social, intellectual and manufactured capital. So I'll go into those in more detail later. Um, these six capitals are embedded in what we call the Fair Shares model. Um, and have been um, worked into uh, the processes and the development uh, methodology of Fair Shares Labs, which are incubators of social enterprises. And I will talk a little bit about social enterprises later. So there are four papers that are uh, rooted in what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm, I'm sort of giving you a, a quick overview of, of the work that's been going on over the last two, three years. Um, the idea of fair shares um, has been developed by researchers, students and lecturers at Sheffield Business School. And we formed the Fair Shares Association and we now have about 60 members worldwide. Um, every one of these members has made some form of contribution to the development of the fair shares model. Um, the European project that we undertook over three years uh, was in five countries. I'm going to take one case. Uh, later in this talk, Resonate Cooperative Limited, which is in Ireland, um, and illustrate how the six forms of wealth framework can be useful for understanding both the ethics and the value that is created by a cooperative social enterprise. Let's start, though, with the challenging times that we're in. These questions you give yourself a moment to think about these questions. If you're like me, um, this has been a time for reflection about what exactly is a valuable enterprise. Yeah, what, what do we really depend on rather than what do we just like? Uh, and I've been struck at the, the way that the most advanced economies and the biggest companies, they're, they're relatively powerless in, powerless in the face of um, this microscopically small virus and it's reshaping uh, our attitudes to different professions, different workers. Suddenly people who were not really taken very seriously have become our key workers and it calls into question whether the neoliberal market economy can ever provide our basic needs and I would argue that it also calls into question whether it can survive in its current form. I think we need to ask, what is wealth? If we think about wealth differently, we will design our businesses differently. And that's what this conversation is all about. Now, the problem has been created uh, by 40, 50 years of neoliberal doctrine, which has advanced the idea that we should just in, you know, accumulate financial capital more and more, uh, make more and more profit, and that will lead to higher standards of living. Um, that's been problematized by many people. Uh, a key, a key critique uh, came from Wilkinson and Pickett, two academics at the end of their lives, using the the wisdom that they've generated uh, over thirty years of research, and they found that inequality costs us. Yeah, it's not just unfair. It actually is a very inefficient way. Um, of organising society and it damages our societies as well as the environment. Um, and that's the same conversation that my field uh, of social enterprise has been advancing. Um, we draw on the work of Karl Polanyi uh, and what's interesting here is Karl Polanyi said that all societies that sort of predate the market economy understood that the market was only one small part of a bigger mix. The other mix is being our public institutions and our mutual associations and societies. Um, so we need to uh, 
re-energise the mutual economy and the public economy in order to uh, deal with the issues that have been created by the market economy. A key part of this is beginning to think of capital as something more than financial accumulation. If we can do that, if we can reframe the conversation about capital, uh, then I think we have a route back to designing ethical businesses. And that is clearly the theme of this conference. Now, there's been some help along the way. Um, there have been plenty of people prepared to reframe the notion of capital. So Becker talked about human capital, and that's got a long tradition. Um, the abilities of people, their energy, their health are all valuable. Um, social capital theory develops on the bonds between us, the bridges between communities, the levels of trust, the notion of reciprocity, and has really come to the fore um, since Eleanor Ostrom won a Nobel Prize. I think a lot, a lot more people are plugged into the wealth that comes from the way that we uh, have social relationships. Natural capital, clearly the environmental movement has put this uh, up the agenda. Um, and this particular paper by Reed and Scott Cato talks about this debate about whether we should have carbon credits or not. Um, something else that's been useful, I think, is to divide financial capital from manufactured capital. So our economic assets, you know, in the narrower sense of the word, uh, are already embedded in things we've created. Uh, and not just, we don't, it's not just about money, it's about using those other assets as well. So I think that this is a basis for rethinking um, ethical business. If we can approach business in terms of generating access to these types of capital um, and improving them, then we have a basis for designing ethical businesses. Um, and this is one way that we can look at the field of social enterprise and certainly since 1978, the notion of the triple bottom line in connection with social enterprise has been uh, an active conversation. So let me just take a little bit of a closer look at the six forms of wealth. So this is um, from a paper by Maureen McCulloch and myself based on a critique of uh, work by the International Integrated Reporting Council. And the thing that to note here is that we talk about access to them, the legal right of access. What does a business do to improve our access to good quality land, air, water? Do we share our knowledge of the chemical reactions that reside in nature with others? Do we share the skills that people have? Do we share um, our knowledge, our intellectual ideas in ways that uh, enable other people to use them? Private businesses shut down, they enclose whereas social enterprises open up, and indeed public authorities can open up. Um, but we need to understand what is valuable. Um, one way of looking at value is um, thinking of organisations as facilitating access to these six forms of capital, um, and also being cognisant of the way that they use them. So that's the lens that I now want to apply both to my own field of social enterprise and to a specific case study of, of Resonate Co-op. Um, but before we do that, just, just to, to visually represent them, um, everything starts with natural wealth. Everything must come from nature originally. We as, as people come from nature. Our communities, our societies come from nature. Um, all of the materials to make our manufactured things come from nature. Um, it's our skills in networks that enable us to put together intellectual ideas, manufacture things, and then go to the market and sell them and reinvest what we get from the market back into um, these forms of wealth. So in, in the field of social enterprise, and, and this is now, I think, a, a pretty established view, not just by myself and Mike Bull, but in an international network that we both belong to, that there are three empirically established modes of uh, being enterprising that uh, lead to social and environmental benefit. The first and the one that I'm most, most closely connected to is cooperative and mutual enterprises. And a number of legal forms, a number of characteristics, but 
the idea is that it creates, co-ops create human, social, intellectual and financial wealth through their model of co-ownership and participation and the equitable way in which they distribute the benefits. Um, charity trading and socially responsible business also apply their resources to the creation of, of social or public benefit. Um, and I think it's easy to, you know, it's not just the small community association that deals with a particular issue. In places like Bangladesh, uh, charitable foundations and trading businesses, a combination of charitable trading and socially responsible business. These are some of the largest businesses um, in that part of the world. So BRAC, for example, organises a huge amount of healthcare and telecoms and other uh, businesses that uh, uh, would, would in other countries are organised in different ways. A few working examples. So uh, Resonate Cooperative I'm going to talk about in a moment, so I won't dwell on that. Uh, another couple that I've been supporting in the last two years, Uni1. Uh, is incorporated in 2019 and they talk about a fair shares commons company. So the the idea here is that the forms of wealth that you generate, you need to organize them uh, for the next generation. So it's an intergenerational model. I think uh, you think about how you pass uh, the resources that you've created on to the next generation, not just for the current generation. And then VME Co-op is a, a software retailer, produces software for retail cooperatives um, and they've just transitioned from a company owned by two people to being owned by the workforce. So around half a million pounds a year that used to be um, go into the pockets or at least into the uh, share value of the two founders is now shared between a trust and the individual engineers who run the business. Um, and they will be creating software to support people like Resonate uh, and, and Uni1 as well. So let's just focus on or we'll look at resonate through this lens of uh, six forms of wealth. So we've got two columns here. One is looking at the kind of wealth that they use. So this is an analysis that we did during the European project. And then subsequently, five of my students deconstructed it um, each for themselves and we aggregated their findings. So they do f use all the different forms of wealth. Uh, in hardware, there's ICT hardware, software that they use, the, the music that is produced uh, by musicians. So it's, uh, sorry, I should have said Resonate is a music streaming site. Um, and they're trying to organise the music streaming in order to improve the incomes of independent musicians. They obviously use uh, natural minerals in the equipment. They're using programming skills, designing skills, time, energy. Um, networks, they build particular networks between organisations in order to reach the market. They're using open source software from uh, a company called Lumio. Um, but they also generate, they're conscious. So, for example, tree planting, a carbon offsetting programme, makes sure that um, any carbon that is used by their servers is replaced. Um, on the human side, they're developing knowledge of disruption, how to disrupt an industry to reconstruct reconstruct it um, so that it is more more fair to the stakeholders in that industry. Um, they're producing member networks, they're producing new forms of partnership, they're producing grassroots live uh, music events through uh, this new platform. They're also creating new open source software, so they're sharing their intellectual wealth. They're not enclosing it so, uh, as a private company would do, they are opening it up for other people to copy and use. Um, they also uh, have claim, uh, I say claim, that they uh, double the amount of income from streaming of the software, although the level of streaming uh, still needs to be increased further on the platform. So it's about what you can learn by looking at an organization through this lens, looking at the, uh, the resource mix in, in these six capital terms and also the outputs of the organization in these six capital terms. So I want to offer this as a mindset for the future. So looking at the nature of business through the fair shares model um, actually changes what we believe, you know, what social enterprise can be conceived as. It's, it's, it's not about you know, charity and non-profit trading, as a lot of people think. It's about 
enterprises that create multiple forms of wealth and that they distribute those multiple forms of wealth through a wider stakeholder network through the legal and, and they achieve this using a cooperative model with multiple member classes so founders labor user investors they emphasize participatory democracy uh, and something called sociocracy because that creates more um, social capital it creates more human capital um, so the future of social enterprise isn't just about a charity or a non-profit mindset it's about the generating of dis and distribution of multiple forms of wealth could Quakers use this mindset to devise businesses? Um, I was part of a conversation at the Employee Ownership Association when Cadbury's had been bought by Kraft Foods and uh, multiple speakers there said if Cadbury's had done what John Lewis had done, maybe um, some of the social benefits of Cadbury's that had been achieved in the past could have been sustained more effectively into the future. Um, it's a conversation to have. We do think that this sixth forms of wealth could provide a basis for accounting for value in a new way in the future. Um, and I look forward to the conversations that we'll have about it now and later. Thanks very much.